All right, picking up where we left off. This is part five of chapter six, learning. How can behavior modification help you get in shape? Behavior modification is the use of operant conditioning techniques to eliminate unwanted behaviors and replace them with desired ones. Token economies operate on the principle of secondary reinforcement. Tokens are earned for completing tasks and lost for bad behavior. Tokens can later be traded for objects or privileges. Biology and cognition influence operant conditioning. Behaviorists such as Skinner believed that all behavior could be explained by straightforward conditioning principles. However, a great deal about behavior remains unexplained. Biology constrains learning, and reinforcement does not always have to be present for learning to take place. Animals have a hard time learning behaviors that run counter to their evolutionary adaptation. Marion Breland and Keller Breland used operant conditioning techniques to train animals, but ran into difficulty when they chose tasks that were incompatible with innate adaptive behaviors. They had a raccoon drop coins in a bank for a commercial. The raccoon eventually preferred rubbing the coin like it was food. Pigeons cannot learn to peck to avoid a shock because pecking is how they eat. They can flap their wings to avoid a shock because that mimics flight, and that is a natural defense strategy. Conditioning is most effective when the association between the response and the reinforcement is similar to the animal's built-in predispositions. The raccoon wasn't likely to treat the coin as anything but food. The pigeon's response is based on their defense. All right, there's an acquisition and performance distinction. Tolman's studies involved rats running through mazes. Three groups of rats. One got no food, one got food every time, and the other got food intermittently. As a result, the first group just wandered around because they never got any food. The second group learned quickly how to get to the food. And the third group, after 10 trials were given, food and showed an amazing learning curve. Basically they sat around, didn't know what was going on, but as soon as the food happened they caught on real quick. The cognitive map is a visual, spatial, mental representation of an environment. The presence of reinforcement does not adequately explain insight learning, but it helps determine whether the behavior will be subsequently repeated. The significance of the cognitive map is that the rats in this maze, when they're given the food, they would form that map and they'd be able to find it very quickly because they created a cognitive map of their environment. All right, Tolman argued that learning can take place without reinforcement. Latent learning takes place in the absence of reinforcement and insight learning is a solution that suddenly emerges after a period of either inaction or contemplation. In Tolman's study of latent learning, rats that were regularly reinforced for correctly running through a maze, group two, showed improved performance over time compared with the rats who did not receive reinforcement, group one. Rats that were not reinforced for the first 10 trials, but were reinforced thereafter, showed an immediate change in performance, group 3. Note that between days 11 and 12, group 3's average number of errors decreased dramatically. That would be the red line in the graphic. Dopamine activity underlies reinforcement. The neurotransmitter dopamine is involved in addictive behavior and plays an important role in reinforcement. When hungry rats are given food, they experience an increased dopamine release in the nucleus accumbens. This is a structure as a part of the limbic system. The greater the hunger, the greater the dopamine release. 
More dopamine is released under conditions of deprivation than under conditions of no deprivation. In operant conditioning, dopamine release sets the value of the reinforcer, and blocking dopamine decreases reinforcement. Dopamine blockers can also help people with Tourette syndrome regulate their involuntary bodily, body movements. How do we learn from watching others? Learning can, alert, learning can occur through observation and imitation. Observational learning is the acquisition or modification of a behavior after exposure to another individual performing that behavior, also known as social learning. Observational learning is a powerful, adaptive tool for humans and other animals. All right, now we're going to discuss a psychologist named Bandura. He had some observational studies. It involved a Bobo doll. If you've not heard of a Bobo doll, this was something from the 60s and 70s, I think. It's a blow-up doll that if you punch it in the face, it would go backwards and then come right back up because it was weighted at the bottom. In this scenario, children were split into two groups. One group watched adults playing with a bouncy Bobo doll and the other group watched adults freaking out on the Bobo doll in a way that mimics fighting the doll. That group was then more likely to treat the Bobo doll in a violent way, as opposed to the other group. Psychologist Albert Bandura's studies suggest that exposing children to violence may encourage them to act aggressively. All right, here's some images from the Bandura Bobo doll studies. In Bandura's studies, the two group of preschool children were shown a film of an adult playing with a large inflatable doll called Bobo. One group saw the adult play quietly, not shown here, and the other group saw the adult attack the doll, shown in the top row here. When children were allowed to play with the doll later, those who had seen the aggressive display were more than twice as likely to act aggressively towards the doll. Modeling is demonstration and imitation. Modeling is the imitation of an observed behavior, so these children in that experiment modeled the behavior of the adults. <clears throat> modeling is effective only if the observer is physically capable of in imitating the behavior. Imitation is much less common in non-human animals than in human. Adolescents who associate smoking with admirable figures or peers are more likely to start smoking later in their life. That's an example of modeling. Movie smoking and adolescent smoking. This double y-axis graph compares the declining rate of smoking in movies with the declining rate of adolescent smoking. The blue line in the graphic represents the mean number of smoking scenes. If you remember, the term mean means average. The red line represents adolescents who report smoking in the past 30 days. If you remember, this is just a correlation. It does not imply causation, but does show a relationship that occurs naturally in the world. Vicarious learning involves reinforcement and conditioning. Vicarious learning is learning the consequences of an action by watching others being rewarded or punished for performing the same action. A key distinction in learning is between the acquisition of a behavior and its performance. Learning a behavior does not necessarily lead to performing that behavior. I can tell you in a really good example of this. I can remember when I was four years old and witnessing my parents punish my brother taught me what I could get away with and what I could not get away with. I used that knowledge to my advantage. All right, here's a handy graphic from a book. It lays out observational learning. It involves modeling, which is imitating the behavior seen in others, and vicarious learning is learning to engage in a behavior or not after seeing others being rewarded or punished for performing that action.
Watching violence in media may encourage aggression. The extent to which media violence impacts aggressive behavior in children is debatable. Some studies demonstrate desensitization to violence after exposure to violent video games. However, it is difficult to draw a line between playful and aggressive behaviors in children. Most research in the area of TV and aggression shows a relationship between exposure to violence on TV and aggressive behavior. Fear can be learned through observation. Scientists named Maneka noticed that lab-reared monkeys were not afraid of snakes to the same extent as monkeys in the wild. Two groups of monkeys. One group was raised in captivity and the other in the wild. There was food placed just beyond a case with a snake in it. The wild monkeys would not go near the food and basically freaked out. The captive monkeys, however, thought nothing of it until they were shown the wild monkeys' reactions to the snake. And it was after that that the captive monkeys feared that snake. Her research demonstrated that animals' fears can be learned through observation. In this case, the captive monkeys probably never come across a snake, don't even know what it is. Why worry about it? Just go get the food. That's the only environment they've ever known. And they learned by watching the wild monkeys to be fearful of a snake. Social forces also play a role in fear learning in humans in much the same way. You might not think much of a stimulus until somebody next to you freaks out about it. And this kind of brings us to mirror neurons. These are neurons in the brain that are activated when one observes another individual engage in an action and performs a similar action. They may serve as the basis of imitation learning, but the firing of mirror neurons does not always lead to imitative behavior. There are possibly, they are possibly the neural basis for empathy and may play a role in humans' ability to communicate through language. So what's happening here is if somebody does something, it's kind of like your brain knows which neurons are associated with it. So you watch this thing happen, and in your mind, those neurons fire. And it may not produce the behavior, but they still fire in the brain. So in that way, it might serve as the basis of imitation learning. And that concludes Part 5, Chapter 6, Learning.